Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. This is Lecture 3, Exposure. If you remember from last week, we started talking a little bit about exposure and, and introduced um, uh, some of the, uh, some, or, or just talked a bit about light as well. And we talked about how light is electromagnetic radiation. Now it's the propagation of photons where we um, can use that, use a measure of photons to determine brightness, but also it has this property of wavelength and, the, and the, the length of the wave or its wavelength basically determines the colors that it has. Um, and uh, also, we as, as humans, our eyes uh, capture these photons using a variety of, of cells within the eye, including rod cells and cone cells, where each, is, uh, each actually has a, a separate um, uh, response to, to light. And we talked about how cones are primarily used for uh, detailed vision and, and color vision, whereas rods are better for night vision and for motion. And uh, we even talked uh, a little bit about um, the, the actual response of uh, these cells to light itself. So we have uh, three different types, so S, M, and L uh, uh, cone cells referring to small, medium, or long wavelengths. And then we have this dashed line, which, is, uh, which represents rods. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about this that uh, I didn't actually get to mention last time is that you'll notice that uh, this, the, the rod sensitivity uh, peaks at about this at about the cyan wavelength, but it drops off to pretty much zero at uh, at a very pure red light. And this is very useful to us because if you are ever um, outside at night or even in, in a very dark room or a very dark area at night, and you need to preserve your night vision, you can use red light to try to illuminate uh, a portion of uh, whatever it is that you want to look at. And because the rods uh, do not, are not stimulated at all by, by red light, particularly you know, as, it's, as it's very, very red, not just sort of a kind of red, but I mean very red light, uh, then that means that it's not going to destroy your night vision. So your, your rod cells will still be sensitive to light without having, to, without having readjusted your night vision to sort of, a, uh, you know, sort of daylight vision, for example, where you then are not able to see anything. So uh, this is particularly useful if you need to just, if you are outside for a long time, maybe taking photos or just doing something and you, and you ha need to preserve your night vision for whatever reason, you can use a pure red light uh, to do it. And why um, more automakers, for example, haven't picked up on this, particularly for dashboard lights and, and this sort of thing is, is sort of beyond me. They love to have all these futuristic looking uh, dashboard lights that are you know, very blue and very white. And this very easily destroys our night vision, which uh, though I you know, obviously haven't done any sort of scientific testing, it just sort of seems like it's a bad idea to destroy your night vision when you're driving around at night. Um, but anyway, so we talked about the similarity of our eye to an actual SLR camera and how uh, there's, there's some similarities in that we uh, light enters in through basically through the front of our eye through and is focused by a lens and is captured and picked up by sensors or the cells, these rods and cone cells in the back of the eye, much like the same thing happens in an SLR camera. And we talked about how uh, the different quantities of photons, the more photons you have, the brighter something is and that a camera sensor or a camera's piece of film, if it's a film camera, is very, uh, very um, sensitive to a very specific region of, of intensity, so such that if it's any darker, if it's any less intense than that, then it's just going to appear black. And if it's any more intense than that, then it's just going to appear white. And so there's this very limited range that we can actually take well-exposed photographs. And so there is usually something that we have to do in order to try to limit the amount of light, for example, so that we don't get overexposure like this, and try to limit the number of photons that actually reach the sensor itself. And this was the introduction to bring us into exposure, about how there's a variety of exposure controls that we have on the camera that allow more or that allow potentially fewer photons to enter and to reach the sensor for us to measure it. And, and the first one that we talked about last week was shutter speed. And so since photons are what determines, the, or the quantity of photons determines the brightness of, of, of whatever it is that you're looking at, if you double the number of photons, then you are effectively doubling the brightness. And we talked about how this uh, 
was the concept of a stop in photography, so that whenever we had one stop difference in light, we had in either a double in the number of photons or a half in the number of photons, and therefore a doubling of intensity or halving of it. And, and however, if you uh, notice from this uh, image here, even though, it, even though we have actually captured twice as many photons in this one stop increase from the, well, from the properly exposed photograph, it doesn't, may not appear to us, like if we're just looking at it with our eye, to be twice as bright. That's because our eyes play tricks with us when it comes to color and intensity and a variety of, of these other things. But using shutter speed, we can actually use it to uh, have a variety of effects. So for example, if we have a long shutter speed, we can capture motion with it and we can smooth out motion that, uh, that otherwise would be um, very, very still. However, on the opposite end of the spectrum, sometimes you actually want to capture still, Im or still images and try to stop the motion as much as possible, particularly with sports. And of course, like with every rule, there is, uh, there is an exception to this one as well. And sometimes there are some sports where you may want a little bit of blurriness or a little bit of motion blur in the, in the photo in order to capture a little bit of, of, of livelihood or a little bit of uh, just some of what was going on in that particular scene. It's not very interesting in this particular photo if you know everything was absolutely still then it would could just look like that car was just sitting there and, and there's nothing really going on. So um, but mixing motion blur with uh, with having with having a very sharp subject uh, can be tricky because you have to keep one particular subject uh, absolutely uh, centered or not centered but absolutely still relative to the sensor itself so uh, as you can see some of the the numbering on this car is actually relatively sharp and that's because as this car was moving uh, if you follow if you follow it with your camera lens and you know basically track it follow it as it's moving along then it remains still relative to the sensor and you don't get this motion blur but what can happen if you don't uh, take care to keep something very still, for example, if you have a long shutter speed without a tripod, for example, you will actually get a blurriness that can result in the image. And I'm sure many of you have seen, if not all of you, have, are familiar with motion blur um, as a problem. And so, uh, and, and so using shutter speed, we usually see um, uh, numbers in the form of like one one thousandth of a second, one one hundred twenty fifth of a second, or one sixtieth of a second, something like this. Uh, and, and don't get too confused about uh, what is a shorter and what is a longer shutter speed. If it's a fraction like one sixtieth of a second, that's a slower shutter speed than say one one hundred twenty fifth of a second. Uh, and the reason for that is that one sixtieth of a second is is actually a longer amount of time. Um, that it is open than 125th of a second. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And those two are, are actually about one stop away from each other because they're each half uh, or a doubling of, of the shutter speed, basically. So there's more than just the shutter speed that we can uh, change in a camera. So uh, this is, though we can use shutter speed to try to get certain effects, we're usually limited by other uh, features or limitations even of the camera and of physics itself uh, that determine basically what shutter speed we can set. So as you can imagine, if I had taken this photo here, for example, and it was taken at one one thousandth of a second, and let's say I increased uh, the exposure by one stop to one five hundredth of a second, so that means that, okay, now it's, it's open for a little bit longer, and maybe I'll get a little bit more motion blur, but those speeds, you know, maybe not, it's, it's, it'll be tough to tell, but what will happen to the photo itself if that's the only change I make? That's right, it becomes brighter, it becomes one stop brighter, and in certain aspects of this image, this may become very bad, so there's some fairly white regions in this photograph that if, it, if it's increased by one stop, the, the number of photons that are hitting the sensor may overwhelm it in a sense, and you may just get big white splotches or, or it'll just, you know, it'll look horribly overexposed in certain aspects or in certain regions of the photograph. This isn't going to happen, of, of course, in, throughout the entire photograph. For example, this black area down here will now appear a little bit more gray, but uniformly you will see an increase in brightness. So we have to be able to adjust some other settings on the camera to try to compensate for this. So maybe I did want a shutter speed of one five hundredth of a second, but is there something else that I could do in order to achieve this? 
And so that brings us to the second setting that we can essentially set on a camera, or the ISO, or the sensitivity, if you want to think of it that way. Though the sensitivity is a bit of a misnomer in the digital world. And uh, it's OK if you think about it like that for now. But as, as you'll see, especially a few lectures from now when we talk about digital cameras, uh, digital cameras don't actually change their sensitivity. It's sort of a trick what they do in order to change the ISO. Um, but anyway, if you're familiar with film, you might recognize uh, some of these values. For example, ISO 100. If you had a film camera, you went to the store to buy some film, and you bought ISO 100 film, you knew uh, that you could really only use that film outdoors or in very bright, very sunny locations. Otherwise, there just would not be enough light in order to capture an image. For example, you just it would be very, very difficult to capture an image indoors unless you had a tripod and a very long exposure. Uh, similarly, you could use a very high ISO, a very high sensitivity, ISO 1600, for example, uh, which is pretty, well, it's, it's very close to sort of the extremes of, of film sensitivity, of what you would buy, you could buy more, but this is kind of representative of, of how much you could actually buy and, and be able to use it somewhat frequently. Uh, whereas, I, so this higher ISO, would allow you to have faster shutter speeds so that you would then be able to take pictures indoors in darker areas, for example. And it sort of makes a little bit of intuitive sense as well, even if you're not familiar with this sort of give and take between ISO and shutter speed, that if you increase the sensitivity of something, then you'll be able to then, you know, if you're increasing the sensitivity to light, then things will appear to be brighter, maybe for the same shutter speed. And that's precisely what's going on. But just like shutter speed, we don't get this for free. We don't get this, this extra sensitivity in the camera without a cost. And the cost in this case is noise. Whether it's film noise or in digital cameras, digital noise, which you can see particularly in the black and gray regions here in the comparison of these, uh, of these two ISO uh, images. And so as a result, you have to be able to balance each of these things when you're taking a photo. Do I want to sacrifice the cleanliness, so to speak, of the photo to be able to get a slightly faster shutter speed? Or do I absolutely have to have a very fast shutter speed and the cleanest image possible? These are all things that we have to consider. So the range now of a digital camera uh, it, it really depends on the camera. As technology advances, usually the range increases, but pretty much on most any modern camera, you'll see ISO 100 to 400, even maybe 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. It goes up and up and up, and now uh, the most modern cameras uh, actually have ridiculous ISOs, but um, I'll, I'll save my excitement about talking to, about that and for, for just a minute. Um, but Usually when you set the camera to its fully automatic mode, usually it will try to automatically select an ISO for you. And as you can see in the difference between these two images, that's not always what you want. Sometimes you really want to have a very clean shot and be able to get as little noise as possible within it. So you'll want to override that particular, uh, that particular automatic setting. And usually when, it, when the camera has an automatic setting such as this, it's just a subset of what that camera's capabilities are. So usually cameras that are capable of, say, ISO 100 to 1600 will only automatically select maybe ISO 100 to 400 or 100 to 800 um, or, or something like that. And so very much like um, shutter speed, these IS, this sensitivity or this ISO actually has, uh, we rate it in terms of stops. But, uh, and, and also very much like uh, shutter speed, a doubling or a halving of, of the uh, sensitivity will double or half the sensitivity. So in other words, as we go from ISO 100 and we double that to say ISO 200, we are now twice as sensitive, for example. So now back here at this particular image, uh, you'll see that I have, uh, it, this was taken at 1 1,000th of a second at ISO 400. So let's say that I, that I increase the ISO to ISO 800. Now what this allows me to do is have one stop faster shutter speed at one two thousandth of a second, and it will be exposed the exact same way. Remember I had mentioned before that if I change to the shutter speed without changing any other exposure values, I'm going to change the amount of light that enters into the camera and therefore the exposure of the final image. But I can adjust two of these settings, for example, and be able to maintain the same exposure while getting different effects. 
So by increasing the shutter speed to one two thousandths of a second, for example, I'll now be able to freeze the motion a little bit better, even though if you look at it, it's, it's already fairly well frozen, but maybe it's, you know, things are happening a little bit more quickly than what this shutter speed would allow, but at the cost of having a slightly higher amount of noise in the image. So as I increase, as I double the sensitivity, this is doubling this, or this is allowing me uh, you know, one stop additional shutter speed that I could gain back in speed, if that makes sense. So normally, uh, especially in, in film jargon, uh, whenever you would go to a store, for example, and buy ISO 1600 film, they'd always call it fast film. And, and this never made a lot of sense to me when I was a kid. Like, why would I buy a, a slow camera when I could have a fast camera? I didn't understand what the difference was. But the, the reason is that when you have more sensitivity, you can have a faster shutter speed for the same amount of light. And that's all that this, this differentiation between fast and slow film or fast and slow uh, sensitivity means. And in fact, there's, uh, you, you'll see that this fast and slow uh, differentiation actually applies to a lot of things. People use it to differentiate between lenses, for example. There's fast lenses and slow lenses. And there's uh, a whole variety of things that this, that this terminology applies to. And it's referring to specifically the shutter speed. OK, so this particular example, if you're curious, actually comes from a, uh, a compact camera from a few years ago, a Canon PowerShot SX100IS. Um, and what, what I want you to pay attention to is, is the difference in the noise characteristics between this slide and the next one, which is representative of a digital SLR from the same era, from sort of the same technological generation. OK, so if you pay particular attention, um, to the ISO 1600 section, and especially the black or the gray region where you can see in this, uh, you know, a lot of noise in particular. As I move to the next slide, you'll notice that it is, it is markedly better. It's quite a bit decreased. And there's something to be said uh, uh, about the size of the camera. And, and may not apply to all things, but in photography, one thing is certainly true, and that size does matter. As things get a little bit bigger, things are easier in terms of the physics in order to capture some light. So um, there's other things going on as well. But it, for right now, if we, if we break it down and simplify it uh, to its constituent components, one of the major factors between why this ISO 1600 is much cleaner, much less noisy than the ISO 1600 of the compact camera, it deals with the size of the sensor in the camera itself. The larger sensor is able to capture more photons and is therefore able to be a bit more sensitive. So uh, in this particular case, this camera is from uh, uh, a Canon 40D. So now we're one generation newer now at a, at a 50D, but I think the noise characteristics haven't really changed much. Usually as, as technology progresses, uh, the, the noise characteristics actually get better and in fact, uh, some companies uh, like, or, or I guess that's perhaps too general, but Canon specifically recently decreased the number of megapixels in one of their digital cameras, their compact camera lines that they announced recently in an effort to combat noise and to get noise to be as low as possible in low light situations. And so, as, uh, so while size certainly does play a factor, um, the age also plays a factor. Newer technologies is generally a lot better at dealing with noise than older technology was. However, there is a physical limit, and we are actually quickly approaching that. Yes? What exactly is happening with the size of the uh, sensor that's causing the noise? I mean, what is it about the sensors I mean, specifically that are causing the when light is a, a larger sensor, you get less? Noise? So what, OK, so just to repeat for the camera, so why is it? What, is it, what exactly is happening, or why does a larger sensor have better noise characteristics? And, and we could go into a bit of detail, but you can think of it. Remember, um, when, when we're talking about the intensity of light, we said that we're, we're quantizing or counting the actual number of photons. So it, the more number of photons that we have, the brighter something appears. And you can imagine that um, if you have a fixed amount of light, for example, in this room or outside with the sun, uh, or more generally, you can think of this as uh, rain that's falling from the sky. So if you have one bucket uh, that's a certain size and you're collecting some rain and you have right next to it a much larger bucket, you're collecting more raindrops into the larger bucket. And that's sort of the same thing that's going on. You're collecting more photons in the larger sensor 
and therefore it, it doesn't have to work so hard to count them, if that makes sense. So there's, there's a lot less error when it's counting those, those photons in these, in these smaller buckets, so to speak. Uh, and it's just a lot easier for larger sensors to then count uh, these, these photons. No, noise is not spillover light. There's, there's a variety of reasons why we have noise. Um, so uh, uh, one of them is that it's the electronics inside the camera that are causing some noise. So better quality electronics will uh, generate less noise, for example. Uh, the other is literally just an error in, in trying to count the number of photons that it's collected. So um, if you have, like to go back to this bucket analogy that we're actually going to refer to many times throughout the semester, but if you have a smaller bucket and you have sort of an inaccurate ruler, then you're going to get some error in how you measure how much water you've, you've collected, if that makes sense. So maybe you're, or you're doing it, uh, this is, I can very quickly make the analogy break down, but maybe you're doing it too quickly and you're just trying to, uh, um, um, and you're just trying to get a, you know, a basic level or basic reading of it, and so you could inaccurately, if just somehow inaccurately count uh, the amount of water in that bucket, then you're introducing some error into that measurement, and then that uh, reveals itself in the end photo as noise within the, within the photo itself. It's just the differentiation. It's miscounting somehow, or some, somewhere in the electronics is adding additional noise to it. This is a complex subject. We actually talk about this in the digital camera lectures when we focus more specifically on sensors and why this happens, but that's just sort of a general, a general overview. OK, but uh, in this particular camera, the, the 40D, this is from several years ago now, and there are more modern cameras. This actually went up to an even higher ISO of 3200. And so um, while if you're, using, if you're using this compact camera and you set the ISO to 1600 and, and uh, rest assured that it looks worse on the computer screen than it does here on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the projector, just because the, the contrast has changed quite wildly, um, you might say, OK, well, Using ISO 100 on this compact camera is, is actually quite acceptable because it's very clean. There's, there's not a lot of noise. It's not harsh noise. But using 1600, you might quickly learn that you don't really want to use it all that much because not only are you getting all this additional noise, but even if you look at this sort of actual example of a photo, you can see that it becomes a lot splotchier as the camera tries to combat that noise. So there's, there's additional things going on as well where the camera will try to reduce the amount of visible noise. And in doing that, it, it'll actually throw away some of the, the detail that exists in the photo. So you get this sort of blurrier, splotchier, uglier looking photo uh, if it has very, very aggressive um, noise uh, correction cap uh, algorithms built into it. Um, but you might then say that using an SLR, you could actually uh, you use ISO, higher ISOs um, um, a lot more acceptably within your photos. And generally, this, this actually may not be that big of a deal if you don't actually look at your photos you know, at their largest, at 100% on your computer screen. Uh, because then, as you, know, as you zoom out from the photo and make it look a little bit smaller, this sort of stuff averages out. And so you, you get less of the noise. But generally, you will really notice this when you zoom in all the way on your photo when you're trying to look at specific details within it. Um, and so SLRs have pretty much always had better uh, ISO sensitivity or ISO noise characteristics, rather, not, not the sensitivity, because uh, um, as you can see, this is pretty standard. So ISO 100 across cameras is fairly standard. You know that ISO 100 from one camera, even across manufacturers, is pretty much the same. Uh, there, there's some minor variation, but it's pretty much the same from one camera to the next. And so despite that, what we look at is how the noise actually behaves uh, at these various sensitivities. And so these digital SLRs, and this is what I was warning you about early on, if you don't have a digital SLR, you'll quickly realize why you might need one, quote unquote, in your arsenal of, of, of equipment. Um, this is one of the reasons why SLRs have the upper hand against compact digital cameras. Now, it wouldn't really necessarily be fair, though, to use a, comp a modern compact digital camera. If you went out to Best Buy right now and bought a compact digital camera and compared it to a digital SLR that's maybe you know, five or six years old, because the noise characteristics will be very different. Like I said, the technology matters quite a bit. You can really only compare against 
sort of technology from the same era, if that makes sense, even, and even within the same uh, manufacturer. Um, but modern cameras can really get quite high in, in ISO. And so uh, the Nikon D3, the Canon 5D Mark II, these are some of the more expensive digital SLRs that are available on the market today. But they don't just go up to ISO 1600 or 3200 or 6400. They don't even go up to 12,800, but they go all the way up to 20, ISO 25,600. And so you can imagine that, OK, that's a lot of doubling. That's a lot of extra sensitivity that you can get there. And so just because these cameras are capable of it, however, uh, as you can see from here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should always use that particular ISO, because it'll, it will be, and, and this happens even for the SLRs. The higher up the, um, the ISO chain you go, the more noise you're going to get but you're getting a lot of additional sensitivity for you to get faster shutter speeds. And that means faster shutter speeds means that you can hand hold the camera without getting motion blur, for example, if you're indoors. Uh, it reduces your, your dependence on a tripod. It just makes it overall better because you have more options when trying to take a photograph. And so just to give you an idea, uh, so like I said, every time you double the ISO, that's one additional stop. Uh, that you can get in the shutter speed. So let's just say that I take, again, this photo uh, at ISO one, or, or sorry, ISO 400, which is you know, the ISO that it was taken at, at 1 1,000th of a second. Now let's try increasing the ISO and see how fast of a shutter speed we can get. So ISO 800 means that I can get how fast? 1 2,000th. OK, so that's only one stop difference. All right, so let's go to another stop. So now to ISO 1600, that's two stops. So now what's our shutter speed? One four thousandths of a second. So let's go another stop to 3200. What's my shutter speed? Yep, one eight thousandth of a second. So now I have to, oh boy, this is getting hard now. So ISO 6400, and, and by the way, most digital SLRs aren't, won't actually let you go to a shutter speed faster than 1 8,000th of a second. But let's say theoretically we could have a shutter speed that was this quick. We were now up to 16, 1 16,000th of a second. And so you can see that even though uh, it doesn't sound all that impressive that, oh yeah, sure, you know, um, uh, uh, let's see, 25,000, an ISO of 25,600 is only four stops above ISO 1600. This is a lot because it's two times two times two times two. This, you're getting a lot of additional shutter speed uh, for, for what, you know, what sounds like not very many stops. Yes? Quick question. Is there an ISO level that you limit yourself to? Is there a sensitivity that you decide you won't go above? Is there an ISO limit that I will limit myself to? Um, it depends. It's purely dependent on the camera uh, and, and the noise characteristics of that camera. Uh, on, so on my 20D, which is, which is now five years old, I really, I, I'm really wary to go above ISO 1600. Um, and even at ISO 1600, particularly in darker regions of, of the photo, you will see this sort of really obnoxious noise banding, it's called. Where, um, and so you can see some, and so it's not quite as, as bad as this noise, but what, what you will see is very patternized noise. And this isn't good because the noise will be sort of small and then it will increase suddenly, sort of like in a line, and then it will slowly decrease and then it will increase suddenly at, you know, in another line. And you'll just see these bands of noise through the image. And even if you zoom out, you still see these bands and it's horrible, it's really bad. And so um, it really depends on, on the situation. I try not to go um, above ISO 400 or 800 if I really want to have a clean image, but only if it's very bright outside. So if it's bright outside, it's really hard to find noise in, in a, even in a high ISO image. Um, but um, once it gets darker, then you have to really start to limit yourself for the ISO. And so this is a, a really long non-answer, but really you have to look at your camera's noise characteristics and see how it behaves. So for example, like I, like I was showing you before, in this camera, the, the 40D, as you can see, I'd, I mean, at least personally, I'd have no problem using ISO 1600. It's pretty clean images. There's really no obnoxious noise going on. But I'd be a lot more wary to use it in this uh, compact digital camera, where the noise is a lot more uh, obnoxious and, and certainly much more in your face. So um, noise, for the most part, especially digital noise, uh, is regarded as a bad thing. Most people don't like it. Um, 
but a lot of people have this sort of nostalgia for film noise because it was very randomized. It just looked, it, you know, that graininess that film has. People just sort of love the texture and the feel to it. And unfortunately, um, digital cameras just don't have that same sort of texture. It's just, it just, it's harsher. It's more, it's more digital, for lack of a better word. Uh, partly because it is more patternized than, than the film noise that we see today. Um, but just to show you a, a comparison, uh, I do have a slide where we can compare ISO 1600 from film, so a film photo of someone's face from ISO 1600, to ISO 25600 of this Nikon D3 that's now, I, I don't know, now maybe at least a year old or, or at least several months old. And you can see that the noise between the two is actually relatively equal in terms of the quantity of noise. So uh, you can see that, yeah, the film is quite grainy, but so is the, the Nikon. But you are getting four additional stops. And so um, there are still some, some holdouts, um, some people that say that, oh, film is still better than, than digital. Digital just can't match the resolution. It just can't match the noise characteristics. That's, I, I, just, I think that's simply not true anymore. I think digital now is much cleaner uh, in, terms of, in terms of the ISO noise than film was, especially at the higher ISOs. Um, and nowadays, um, manufacturers are getting better about randomizing the noise or the noise or removing this pattern or this banding that I mentioned that existed. The, the, these more modern cameras just do not exhibit this problem as much. And so now, we are at sort of this, this um, golden age of, of digital cameras where we have surpassed film, I think, and so we can now really freely use digital as, as a very good, high-quality medium for this, for this very thing. Um, but anyway, you can notice, so, so to comment specifically on the differences between the noise, uh, you can see that the, the noise in the film is actually very fine, but it's also somewhat grainy. But some of the noise patterns that you'll notice on the digital is that we see we have these various hot spots. So for example, this big red dot that's here. And there's another few that exist on, on the image itself. Now, it's not a problem with this person's face. It's a problem, actually, with the way that this camera is reading the information. Just for some reason, it's adding some additional hot pixels, as they're called, where they're, they're just much brighter than the surrounding pixels, uh, and, and they're not supposed to be. Um, luckily, this stuff is, is pretty well, pretty easily corrected, so you don't have to worry about it too much. The only time you'll see it is if you are really trying very, very hard to, and, and you turn off all of the noise reduction that exists in your camera. Um, but now I think we can, we can really feel free to crank up the ISO on, on a number of these cameras, except if you have a compact digital camera, then you, you should pay attention to it and, and, and note its noise characteristics so that you know um, how, how it behaves. So as I mentioned before, ISO, changing the ISO, now allows us some leeway with the shutter speed so that we could have, we could increase the ISO, we could increase the sensitivity and get a faster shutter speed, as we mentioned before in that, in that previous example with, with uh, the raft, or we could try to decrease the ISO and get less sensitivity, but that means that we get a longer shutter speed. So that means we could decrease the ISO, get a longer shutter speed, and get some motion blur in here, for example. So if you want to get some star trails, for example, you might want to set a relatively low ISO so that you could have a long shutter speed. And the longer that shutter speed is open, the longer you'll be able to capture, say, Vega, the star that's highlighted in red there, uh, and into your photo. But there is, as with all things, this trade-off. So for example, you might take a photo first uh, at ISO 800, and you might do it at that high of a sensitivity initially because you are standing outside on a dock and you, it is absolutely frigid and you want to go inside as quickly as possible. So you set a high ISO so you'll have a relatively fast shutter speed so you can go inside and call it a day. Okay, so on the left is the first attempt at ISO 800 at a shutter speed of, and, and yes, this was, you know, it was dark, so it's a long shutter speed of 336 seconds. Uh, so the left, so that's about six minutes worth of, of shutter speed, and that's because, uh, and, and that's because it's very dark outside. But it's also because of uh, the, the final exposure value that we'll talk about shortly. But on the right, I, well, uh, when I looked at this photo, I said, you know, that's that's pretty and everything, but I have quite, I, I have bumped up the ISO quite a bit. I could decrease it a little bit and have two things happen. I could decrease the amount of noise that exists in this image, 
and I can get a much longer star trail. And so just to solidify this, this concept of shutter speed, by decreasing the ISO now one stop to ISO 400, and that's the only change other than the shutter speed, which is now nearly doubled to about 846 seconds. So it's now 14 minutes long, which is about double the, the speed that it was before. Uh, so the reason that it's a little bit more is that the first time I took the photo, I noticed it was a little bit dark. So I not only wanted to double it, but also wanted to increase it just a little bit more so I could get a little bit more brightness into it. Now you'll notice that the star trail of the same star, Vega, is a little bit longer. It's actually double the length of the star trail here. Not only that, but the noise has also decreased by some considerable fashion as well. And so here, while ISO 800 isn't that bad, and, and, and note that we're zoomed in all the way on this photo, so you're seeing every single pixel, um, but even though it's not that bad, it's still noticeable, especially when compared to the cleaner low ISO image. So um, if you want to take a photo like this, remember that many cameras have this sort of bulb mode where you can usually with a remote or just by, by hand uh, push and hold the shutter down uh, and it'll keep the, the shutter open for as long as you're holding down the button. And so if it is, you know, October, the end of October and you are up in New Hampshire and it is cold and you do want to go inside, then it's usually better to have a remote so that you can just sort of flip the switch and lock it and then run inside, set a timer and then come back out. Um, but you, you don't have to is the point, is that you can use this bulb mode in order to take photos um, very much like this. So there's, there's this, this interplay between shutter speed uh, and ISO and, and as you can see there's, there's just like with many things in, in photography that we're just beginning to scratch the surface of, there's always this give and take of, of there's always these compromises that we are presented with when we are taking a particular photo. Now there are ways that reviewers in particular try to quantify the amount of noise when they, when they want to show you uh, quantitatively how much noise a particular camera has. So if you go to one site in particular, uh, DP Review, Digital Photography Review, Dot com, which has very, very comprehensive uh, reviews, I think, and, and is a very good place to start if you're looking for a, for a digital camera to purchase. Uh, one of the things that they do, and they, they seem to vary this sometimes based on, on the year and you know, basically how they seem to feel about the camera, um, but they will sometimes graph the amount of noise that a particular camera has. And so in this case, uh, this is a camera from the Canon, oh man, uh, Canon A720IS, and I'm just using this as a representative example to show you how we can understand what this means. So what are we looking at here? Well, notice that we have along the x-axis, along the bottom, the ISO range. So we go from 100, there is apparently this camera has a, a lower ISO than, than 100 at ISO 80, but normally it starts at ISO 100 and it goes up in, in increments of about a third of a stop. So it goes from 100 to 125 to 160, so on and so forth, all the way up to the camera's maximum of 1600. And then it measures three different types of noise. So there's a yellow line here, a green line, and a red line. And um, each shows you a different type of noise. So part of the problem with digital is that there's different types of noise that tend to rear their ugly heads onto our photos. So the red line is what's called chroma noise. It's basically the variation in the color uh, in a particular image. So if we were to go back a few steps, you'll notice that uh, in this image here, uh, not only does it seem to, the, the blacks not only seem to change brightness, where there's some spots that get a little bit grayer, but there's also some spots uh, that change colors as well, so that there's some spots that are a little bit bluer or some spots that are a little bit redder. This is chroma noise because there's a variation in color, and that is what that red line indicates. However, um, these other lines basically tell you the difference in the brightness or the luminance, in other words, of both black, uh, this yellow line, so the, the variation of, of how much that black itself changes in terms of brightness, and the gray, so that, that green line. So if you're taking a look at some of this stuff, then uh, this might actually be interesting for you when trying to pick apart some of these reviews and understand this quantitatively. And like I said, I think this is really only useful to compare against um, uh, the noise against cameras of, of a similar generation, just because newer generations are, are almost always going to have better noise characteristics. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, that is generally true.
So now we have two settings on our camera that we can modify when we want to take a photo that is properly exposed and maybe give it some sort of, of exposure effect. So maybe we want to have a longer shutter speed and get some motion blur. Maybe we want to decrease the ISO and clean up the noise a little bit or make the, 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 the image a little bit cleaner. But there's actually a third setting that we have control over as well. And this is called the aperture of, of, the, uh, of the lens. And so uh, basically as, as we've learned about shutter speed and, um, and uh, ISO, we've been figuring out different ways that we can uh, allow photons to enter into the camera and be basically counted by the camera when showing us an image. And so aperture is yet another way to do that. So whereas the shutter speed is actually an amount of time, this is actually, uh, this actually physically blocks or physically allows certain amount of photons or certain amount of light to enter into the camera. And so the whole reason that I show you a, a you know, basically an icon of a lens is that the lens is responsible in almost all cases uh, for changing the aperture and therefore changing the amount of light that is allowed into the particular camera. So uh, inside of the lens and, and very much like our, um, our pupil lets in light. So if you think about the eye for just a moment, we have the pupil that lets in light and in, in light and we have the iris that, you know, it, when it's dark, it gets a little bit bigger to let in more light. And when it's bright outside, it, get, it contracts or it gets smaller to let in less light. And this is exactly what we we're talking about when we were referring to apertures. So there is actually the concept of an aperture for your eye where the aperture is really just the hole, basically the, the size of the hole that allows in the light. So just like our eye, our cameras have an aperture as well. So there's, a, there's an iris of, type, of, of some type that's either metal or plastic and it usually closes uh, down on the lens or inside of the lens so that less light is allowed to be allowed to enter into the lens and therefore allowed to go to the back of the camera. And so this is um, sometimes difficult to notice, but if you have an SLR especially, and, and it's especially useful if, if you have it with you today, though, though you don't need to, um, one of the things is that SLRs have um, what's called a, a depth of field preview button. And one of the things that this button lets you do is that when you click it, there's this, this sort of noise. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's very faint. But what happens is that it actually closes the aperture in the lens and you can actually see how big the aperture is. So if you're looking towards the front, you can actually see it. But if you're looking through the, the actual camera itself, you're not going to see it. It's not going to look smaller. It's just going to change how the, the picture looks. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And so I, I actually am I'm going to, I trust you guys, but I'm going to pass this around and, and allow you to push the depth of field button. And every year, I always get the camera back, and I expect to again this year. But every year, I always get some pretty funny photos on here from people accidentally pushing the shutter button. Um, and, and I am not, it's not beneath me to post them. So, um, so, so, so be careful. So anyway, when you get the camera, there's, um, and, and you'll notice that you know, it's, it's shaped like an SLR, obviously. But to the left of the lens, there are a couple of buttons. And at the bottom of the lens right here, there's a little button. And if you push this button, that's the depth of field preview button. And so if you just hold the camera and push that button, then as you're looking into the lens, you'll see, the, you'll see the, this diaphragm actually close the aperture itself. Now, if it stops working, it's probably because the camera has turned off just automatically. So just flip the switch back here from you know, down to off and then just back up to on, and then you should be able to push the aperture again, okay? All right, so I'll just pass it here and then uh, so for you guys to take a look at this. So as I continue talking about this, but aperture, this one is a little bit more complicated. So whereas in shutter speed, and ISO, we could very neatly, very nicely double or have the numbers in order to figure out how many additional stops or how many fewer stops of light we have to work with. Aperture is actually a bit different. So usually you'll see numbers like 1.4 to 2 to 2.8 to 4 to 5.6, so on and so forth. And this just sounds really messy. But if we think about why this happens, we realize that there's, there's a very legitimate, very real reason why these numbers are so complex. So um, 
the, the aperture is denoted by what's called an F number. And so normally this, these numbers that I just spewed at you, 1.4, 4, 5.6, these are actually F numbers. And the F number is just a ratio. And now, so uh, in, in, in the long run, what's most important to get out of this is that you understand um, what this F number is and what the aperture is and what it does for your camera. Um, but what I'm trying to do today is explain to you why these numbers are as crazy as they are and give you a way to understand them and, and uh, make them a little bit more tangible so that it makes as much sense, hopefully, as the shutter speed and as the ISO. So the first thing uh, to that end that you have to realize for the F number is that it is just a ratio. So we have a focal length, which basically describes how zoomed in the lens is. And we'll talk more about this in the optics le lecture. But the longer focal length you have, it's basically, you know, this is a, you know, a 200 millimeter lens versus what's on the camera right now is a, 20, is a 50 millimeter lens. So it's, it's actually a, it's generally a longer lens as well, and, and it's more zoomed in. Um, so you have, you have to take this focal length and divide it by the diameter of the lens. And so realize that what you are seeing here is, of course, an oversimplification of a lens. So there's, as I showed you in the first lecture, a lens is actually a, a complex mixture of glass elements, where there's not just one piece of glass. There's many glass elements that are combined and, and sorted in different ways so that uh, to, to bend the light, so to speak, into, uh, onto your sensor and, and produce the final image. But there is a glass element in there that's sort of the limiting factor. And so that's that, this is the limiting factor that you can think of as being this diameter here. So you take the focal length, you divide it by the diameter, and you get basically this F number. Now what's important is that, remember that I said that doubling or halving the number of photons will double or halve the brightness respectively? So that can happen through a number of ways. That either means that we can double or have the shutter speed, which actually means that you know, if you have the shutter open for twice as long, you let in twice as many photons. Or in this case, when light is sort of entering in through a lens, you can double or have the area itself of that lens. So if you double the area, then you're letting in twice as much light. If you have the area, you're letting in half as much light. And now the problem here is that you'll notice the F number isn't a function of that area. It deals with the diameter. And so if you remember your geometry, the area of a circle you know, is, is pi r squared or you know, half the diameter squared. And so you have this, this complex thing where in order to figure out the area, you actually have to have this diameter and square and multiply times. And it gets to be quite a mess. And actually, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to worry you with showing you a lot of this math right now, um, but I do have um, a very nice handout that, that I wrote, um, I don't know if it was a couple years ago or what. And in this document, I do show you actually all of the math that goes behind um, this number. And so you can actually see uh, where we get these numbers from and how they are derived and why this makes a difference. Why doubling, well, obviously doubling the the area will increase twice as many photons, but if we you know, take that into account and if we consider the diameter as being part of the F number, then how we get these sort of crazy numbers that are output by it. But there's a couple of, of really important things to remember about um, the F number, and that is that basically what you can do, all right, let's see, I'm going to do this differently than I expected, just because I think this will be a little bit clearer. But um, when you're trying to remember uh, an F number or the F numbers that exist for a camera, uh, you will generally see crazy numbers, like I said, of 1.0, 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5.6. And you may say, well, how on earth have you memorized all these? It's, it actually sounds kind of crazy, but there's actually a very good pattern to this. So each of these numbers represents a one-stop difference in the F number. So that means that you know, if, if I've gone from, 20, from an F number of 22 to an F number of 16, then I've actually doubled this, this ratio, or I've doubled the area. So I'm letting in twice as many photons. So this is a, a change of one stop between each of these numbers. Um, but there's a very easy way to remember this, and that is to memorize these first two numbers, 0.0, 
1.0 and 1.4. Just remember those. And then double each one. So you double the first one first. 1.0 times 2 is 2. Then you double the next one next. 1.4 times 2 is 2.8. And you just keep going. 2 times 2 is 4. 2.8 times 2 is 5.6. 4 times 2 is 8, 5.6 times 2, and, they, and then you know, they round a little bit, it's about 11, so on and so forth, and you can get to this really big, fancy number. And so one of, uh, or, or not necessarily big, fancy number, but generally these are the numbers within the range that you will generally play with uh, when you're talking about a camera, because uh, one stop difference, remember, is, is quite a large change in the amount of light. So if we're doubling or having the amount of light here, if we do this, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times, that's 512 times more light uh, from, you know, the, from the lowest F number, F1, to the highest here. So that's quite a big change. And so um, there's, there's a lot that goes into um, this F number, uh, and obviously it relates very strongly to the lens itself. So all of these lenses have different aperture ratings, and they, they can be... Uh, they can have different uh, large apertures and, or smaller apertures, and, and it really varies a lot. Uh, and we'll talk about some of that stuff a little bit later. Um, but what's most important to realize is that um, the lower F numbers, so besides having remembered this trick where you memorize those two, 1.0 and 1.4, and doubling them will give you this, this uh, line of F numbers. But what's most important to remember is that the lower the F number, the brighter the image. So one of the things that this document is actually going to show you, and I don't want to waste you know, your time um, going over it on the, on the blackboard directly because it can get, it, it just turns into a math lecture basically, <laughs> is that the, the very back page actually shows you calculations where we calculated the F number or the aperture of the pinhole photo. So if you remember uh, from the first lecture, we had this, you know, the, the camera was set on top of here and there was a very small hole at the end of a, of a body cap, basically, that let in a certain amount of light. And that is a restriction of aperture because now the, this aperture is very, very small, especially when compared to the smallest aperture that, that you'll see on the camera as it goes around. Um, and we, we were curious to know what the F number was because the lens that's on the camera right now is capable of, of an F number of two. So f2, and that's pretty respectable. Normally you'll see like f4, f5.6, but we wanted to see what it was, and I, I don't really remember. Um, but we found out that it was actually an f number of 128. So this is actually a very, very small aperture, and we figured out through that even further, we were able to measure you know, about how large the diameter was itself. So we figured that it was about 0.4 millimeters large, the size of that pinhole, just by knowing um, some, some of this simple, relatively simple geometry of knowing the, the area of a circle is pi r squared and by knowing this ratio that the f number is the focal length divided by the diameter. And in fact, um, one of, if you remember from the first lecture, I gave you a little bit of information or I gave you just a little factoid and I said, put this in the back of your mind, it's going to be important for us later on and that was this symbol right here this circle with the line through it. And it is very important now, and especially so when calculating the focal length of the pinhole camera, because this represents, if you remember, what? What does it do? The position of the lens. So the position, not of the lens, but the position of something else. The right, the sensor. It's the focal plane. So where that line goes through the camera, basically, that's where the sensor is, you know, in, in space. It's where that position is. And so by measuring where the hole on the pinhole camera was versus where the sensor was, we were able to determine the focal length of it. And so by knowing the F number and by knowing the focal length, we could then figure out the diameter pretty easily just by dividing a couple of numbers. So yeah, I get excited about this stuff. I, I wasn't you know, an MIT geek, so this stuff excites me a lot. And that's why I'm trying very hard not to, you know, Go, all over, go crazy on the board with all of this math, but all of this stuff is actually pretty interesting and we'll pass out this, um, this document uh, at the break, which is uh, coming up pretty soon. Actually, now it seems like a perfect time to do it, so why don't we take a five minute break uh, and you guys can uh, wet your whistles for, uh, uh, with some of this information here. <laughs> all right, hello everyone, welcome back. So, uh, so 
as you can see, we've uh, passed out these documents now, and, and they'll also be available online and uh, on the course website um, tonight um, for you to follow along. But uh, you'll notice that um, rather than me just talking at you, there's, I think it, it helps to actually look at some of this stuff concretely. And so, for example, I spent um, you know, probably longer than I should have making sure that these two circles on page two were actually twice the area of one the other. But now you can, you can actually see relatively the size of like what doubling the aperture actually means to scale. So A1 on, in this case is actually twice as large as A2, even though it may not look it, it is by area. And so this is one of the reasons why this, this number is so complicated. And if you follow along in the math, hopefully it will make a little bit of sense about where these numbers have come from. But what's, as I mentioned, um, in the end, what's really useful to remember, uh, you don't have to remember the, the, the jargon or even the, the steps that are necessary to, to calculate this or to derive this from scratch. It's really just meant to give you sort of an intuitive feel or a more intuitive feel from where these crazy numbers come from. Um, but in the end, you can just memorize the, that simple rule that I mentioned of memori memorizing 1.0 and 1.4 doubling each. And that is, is uh, shown to you at the bottom of of page three for you to be able to follow along. And so just like with shutter speed and ISO sensitivity, um, when we're changing the F number, we actually are modifying the way the image is going to look. And this is more than just changing how much light is actually entering into it. There's actually a very real impact on the photograph itself by changing the aperture. And that is the background blur. Uh, you might hear this in a couple of different ways. You might hear background blur or depth of fields or incorrectly referred to as bokeh. And we'll talk about some of these things a little bit later. But basically, when you have one lens and you have it set at, at a specific focal length and you decrease the F number, so you're ma making the aperture larger, remember. So you're making, the aperture, or you're making the aperture itself larger, so you're letting in more light. And you're decreasing, as a result, the F number from, say, 5.6 to 4 to 2.8 to 2, so on and so forth, what you are doing is you are isolating the foreground or whatever you, are, whatever you have um, focused on, you're isolating it more from the background. So if you want you know, a very smooth, very, uh, uh, you know, a very nice blurry background that, that you want to use to isolate the foreground, you want to use, among other things, a very, very low F number. You want to go pretty much as low as you possibly can um, that's possible for your specific lens. And so remember um, that I mentioned that uh, the F number is, is just a ratio. It's just the focal length divided by the diameter. And the diameter of a lens is, is very real. It's very fixed. And you cannot, I cannot ex make the diameter any larger than this. So this lens has a maximum rating, has a maximum aperture rating, or it has you know, basically an F number that's printed on it that tells you the lowest F number that I can possibly go to. So if you have a lens that is capable of a somewhat low F number, then what you will get is very nice background blur such as this. Um, and so generally with, um, with these things, uh, or generally with uh, background blur, you can get it through a variety of means. It's not just through modifying the aperture, modifying the F number, though that is one way. Another way to do it is you could have a bigger sensor. Having a bigger sensor, you will generally, for the same F number, have uh, a, a, much, uh, uh, a much shallower depth of field. So in other words, as you get bigger in sensors, in sensor, you will have a blurrier background, all other things remaining the same, though that is a, it's a little bit of a myth, and we'll talk about why in, in a future lecture, of course, but a bigger sensor is just, I mean, that's one of the results of it. And so another thing is that if you have a longer lens, so if you have a, a more zoomed-in lens, in other words, if you have one that's, you know, sort of obnoxiously long like this, you will generally get more background blur than you would in a lens that's more wide, that has, you know, much more of the scene within it. So conversely, if you want to take a photo that has quite a lot in focus. So not only the foreground, but also the background. That means you need to use a relatively high F number, but you also might want to use a relatively you know, low, uh, uh, relatively wide angle lens, or you, you may want to use a, uh, a smaller sensor, such as is found in compact cameras. And so um, if, you, if you have been using a compact camera for a long time, and, and uh, you know, haven't really used an SLR, and you've always sort of looked at, at photos and said, man, how do they get this sort of background blur out of them? It really doesn't matter 
how much you lower the F number on those, you have physics working against you, frankly. And the size of the camera is really limiting the size uh, of the aperture itself. And so um, that, as a result, then gives you a much longer depth of field, a much larger depth of field, which means that you get more uh, of the scene in it. And so there is actually um, another way that, that we can get longer depth of field, and that's using uh, what's called a hyperfocal distance. And we'll talk about that, of course. Since, and like I said early on, there's a lot of stuff where I have to tease it, because if we go over it all, then there's no way we'll, we'll get through everything that we need to get through today. But uh, using the hyperfocal distance, uh, even if you are using an SLR, you can try to extend your depth of field as much as possible. And the depth of field refers to the depth of field that is basically in focus. So the larger the depth of field that you have, the more things in focus that you will have as well. And, and uh, if, if you have an SLR camera and you, and you get a lens such as the, the Nifty 50 that's on the camera that hopefully somebody still has around here, um, one of the things you'll notice when you use some of the lower F numbers is that the depth of field can literally be inches or less on some of these cameras and some of these, uh, on some of these lens uh, combinations, depending on what you're using. And so it can become really quite a pain when before, when you, you could just focus on anything and everything would be in focus with a compact digital camera, then it really becomes an issue of making sure you get the focus absolutely correct. And so there's, um, I mean, this, I mean, well, okay, I'm getting off into a tangent, but this is one of the reasons it's, this is both a pro and a con when we're talking about SLRs. Um, now, one of the things about using a smaller aperture or an F number of higher than about F11 uh, on, or F16 on an SLR or maybe about F8 on a, a compact digital camera is that you actually get uh, an additional physical problem, this, this sort of uh, this, this physics problem that exists that's called diffraction. And so, well, you might think that you know, by putting the absolute highest F number that you possibly can means that you're going to get you know, absolutely everything in absolute sharp focus. You actually have this, this, this physics phenomenon called diffraction working against you where all of a sudden it's going to make everything sort of soft. And it's just going to drive you crazy because you'll say, hey, Dan told me that you know, everything is supposed to be in focus, but it all looks really fuzzy to me. And, and it's a different type of fuzzy than being out of focus. It's, it's actually diffraction. Um, so that, that's just sort of a, a saving my ass sort of thing where I know you're all going to go home and try it and you're going to say you're going to get mad at me but that's that's there's other things working against you as well okay so uh, we talked about these these three ways of modifying values or modifying these these variables so to speak on your camera so that you can get exposure to within a certain limit so you can modify each of these things on your camera to try to achieve a certain effect so in this case for example uh, we wanted a relatively long depth of field. This was using a, a compact digital camera, so I wasn't using a really large F number, but an F number of about F8. And by um, decreasing the ISO to 100 and using a long shutter speed, then I was able to get everything in relatively crisp focus. I was able to get a relatively clean image. That means it's not very noisy. And since there's not really much that's moving, I didn't really care that... Uh, you know, it had a long shutter speed, but obviously at 10 seconds, you either have to be, um, you know, sitting the camera on the ground and, you know, hope that nobody's going to come driving by on this road, or you have to have a tripod with you in order to make sure that you do get an actually sharp uh, photo. But as you noticed, a number of, of these photos actually have careful consideration placed to all three of these settings. And eventually, this sort of stuff becomes second nature to you, where you're thinking you're in a certain situation and you just sort of, you start to learn instinctively what sort of settings you might want to use for that. And you, you will generally tend to focus on some settings over others. So maybe in the case of, of uh, sports, for example, maybe one of the things you want to do is increase the ISO a little bit, not a lot, but just a little bit so you can make sure you get a fast shutter speed. And also, maybe you also want to decrease the F number or make the aperture larger so that you can try to isolate the foreground from the background. And in fact, uh, one of, you know, all of these exposure modes that your camera has on it, so uh, sort of these, these silly modes that so many cameras have nowadays. It's like a guy running like this, and it's sports mode. And then there's another one where there's a sunrise, and that's landscape or, you know, I can't even remember all of this crap that they put on these cameras. They really, all they're doing is they're just placing certain biases on different exposure values. 
And now that you understand what all three of these exposure values are, you can replicate all of these stupid person modes for, I mean, <laughs> Okay, I might you know, regret saying that in the future. But you can replicate all of these for yourself. You can manually set, and you don't even have to manually set all three of these. There's ways that the camera uh, will help you. you know, um, they have a variety of modes, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but they have a variety of modes that will help you choose maybe one of the three or two of the three of these settings, and you can select the rest depending on the situation that you're in or depending on the scenario that you are, that you are in. And so long as you remember what, how each of these impacts the end result, you will actually be able to do exactly what you want to do with the camera itself. So we have these three exposure values. We have shutter speed, sensitivity, and aperture. But there's something that um, I didn't really mention that perhaps impacts the, the way the photo looks even more. Does anybody know what that might be? Yes? What was that? So not even, well, not even the temperature of light, but just the amount of available light. Because it's the amount of available light that you have that really dictates how the rest of this is going to go down. So if you don't have a lot of light uh, available to you, then you're going to have to perhaps alter these, uh, these, each of these settings in a different way than you would if you had tons and tons and tons of light. So in this room right now, for example, there's not a lot of light, so we would have to restrict ourselves to relatively high ISO, relatively low F number in order to get a shutter speed that's respectable enough to be able to hand hold it. But if we have gobs of light, just tons of light, we're outside and it's very, very bright and we have lots of options, then we can have a very fast shutter speed while having a low ISO, having a you know, slow ISO and having a relatively high F number. So um, there is actually a way that you can try to remember when you're um, when you're outside and you want to take a completely manual photograph, so you're setting all three of these things by yourself, there is actually a rule that will help you determine it, and it's called the sunny 16 rule. And on a bright sunny day, and I'm talking bright and sunny, I mean you know, probably brighter than it was today, and, this, and I found that honestly this really works best when you're a little bit farther south than, than we are up here. Um, but you know, midsummer, this will generally work pretty well. On a very bright sunny day, you want a shutter speed of about 1 one hundredth of a second, a sensitivity of about a high ISO 100, and an aperture of f16. So the sunny 16 rule, in other words, means that you set everything to 100, the shutter speed, the ISO, and you just set the aperture to f16. So now let's say that it's slightly overcast, and so now it's maybe one or two stops uh, darker outside than you know, a completely bright, full sunny day. How can I modify these so that I still get a properly exposed photograph. Yes? Yeah, exactly. So I could move the aperture, I can move the F, the F number down a stop or two, so maybe rather than F16, I could have F11 or even F8. Anything else that I could do? Yep, I could turn the sensitivity up, so ISO 200 or 400 would work. Uh, or how about the shutter speed? Can I do something there as well? Yep, so if, yep, you know, I could slow it down. That's right. So I could slow it down so that it, it's open longer and I capture more light. So maybe I would then have maybe 1 50th of a second or 1 25th of a second. But remember, in that case, each of these things, you, when you're thinking about this, you're outside and it's a bright sunny day, you have to remember the impact that each of these values have. So if you're outside and you have a relatively long lens, you remember that trick that I told you before where you can generally hand hold something to one over the focal length. So if, if you have a one, two hundred, or if you have a two hundred millimeter lens, then you know you're kind of pushing it with one one hundredth of a second. And if you go to one fiftieth or one twenty fifth of a second, then forget it. It's almost guaranteed to be blurry. So what you might want to do then is instead lower the aperture by, or lower the f number rather by quite a bit, so that you can then maybe keep the same shutter speed, or maybe even increase it, make it a little bit faster, uh, so that you could then hand hold that. So in general. Um, you have a bright sunny day, you can use the sunny 16 rule. If it's slightly overcast, you would go down one stop to f11. Uh, if it's you know, pretty regularly overcast, then you might go down two stops. If it's heavily overcast, maybe even three stops. Now, um, three stops down would be an aperture of f5.6, because from 16, if we go backwards, 
uh, you know, you, you can reference the, the numbers here if you haven't fully memorized all of them. And, and shame on you if you haven't, right? Because they're so easy. But anyway, if you go from F16, you can see you can count three stops downwards. You realize that you go to F11, F8, F5.6. So that's three stops away. And that would be for a heavy overcast day. So now you can use the manual mode. You can go outside right now if it were a little bit brighter, and you would be able to use the Sunny 16 rule and set all of these values on your camera by yourself without needing to use any of these other modes that help you dictate, or that help, or rather, I mean, it depends on how you want to say it. Some people say it helps you, some people say it dictates for you how the camera is taking the photo, and it really depends on how you're looking at it. Now, um, just to give you an idea, uh, the, so let's say you are outside and it's nighttime and it's full moon. Uh, and that is generally about, I have notes here, 18 to 19 stops darker than the Sunny 16 rule. So rather than doing this, um, uh, if you kept the ISO the same and the aperture the same, 18 to 19 stops slower is actually a shutter speed of, any guesses? No. Any other guesses? Longer. It's about 50 minutes long. So uh, this is just another way of solidifying that one stop is, it's quite, a bit of a, it's quite a bit of a change. So 18 to 19 stops doesn't sound like a lot, but all of a sudden our one one hundredth of a second has turned to a 50 minute exposure to properly expose that particular photograph. So talking about the moon, um, now th th this has been actually a, a bit of, a, of, of an interesting debate for a long time, are the, the, the theories that uh, the moon landings were faked. And there's a variety of, of reasons, you know, ranging from, you know, it could be plausible to down, downright, you know, ridiculous. But one of the, the things that I think is particularly um, enticing to us as, uh, as budding photographers is the fact that people claim that uh, the exposure on these is wrong. And specifically what they're referencing is that if they are on the moon, uh, and taking a picture because there's no atmosphere on the moon, or at least it's very, 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 very little, then we should be able to see stars in the background. But this becomes actually a question of exposure and doesn't actually have anything to do with the atmosphere at all. So you can imagine that uh, I mentioned something about the sunny 16 rule just in the last slide where I said if, it, if you're outside and it's a bright sunny day, you have to have settings like this, which means that uh, you know, if we bump down the aperture a few stops, we could increase the shutter speed, and you would notice that it's a very, very fast shutter speed uh, at you know pretty reasonable sensitivity and aperture value. So even if we go down three stops, for example, so we have rather than f16, we go down to f11, f8, f5.6, and we increase the shutter speed by three stops. That means we go to 200, 400, 1 800th of a second at ISO 100 and an aperture of f5.6. You can imagine that if you're outside at night and you try to take a picture of the stars with those settings, you're not going to get a damn thing. It's going to be so black that you're not going to see anything. And that's exactly what's happening. The sun's light is so overpowering that there is just no way you're going to see these relatively minute stars that are giving off so much less light. Well, they may be giving off as much or more light, but you know, because of the distance, it's just we are getting so much less light from those stars than from the sun that this is just not a valid excuse. And so I got to say that, at least from, from this point of view, that, that that conspiracy theory is, you know, is complete bunk. It's just a complete myth because there's no way that it's possible to happen. And in fact, if we take a look at a more modern photo of the moon taken from uh, Japan's version of NASA, uh, they, they took very high resolution photos of the moon, basically HD video uh, and some high resolution photos of the moon. And they have one picture in particular where the, the earth literally, it's an earth rise. So as you, know, you see the horizon of the moon and then slowly the earth rises from it. And you can see a, a, a number of things happening here. First of all, again, there's no stars, this, and, but more importantly, the shadows given off by the sun because the sun's light is so harsh you can't even see any detail in the shadows and, and I guarantee they were not using uh, cheap camera equipment or anything like that so it's not like you know it's you know it's not like it just wasn't capable of doing it it's just that it's so much darker there's so much there's so little light there's no way that they were able to capture it yes 
Yes, the reason that it's so directional is because there's no atmosphere, so it's not being scattered in atmospheric particles. So uh, right now, if, you know, if, if we go outside where there's still a little bit of sun, but it's mostly down, all the light is being scattered around in the atmosphere and reflecting off a number of things. And so it, it becomes a lot softer for us, especially in, in the very early morning or in the late evening. Uh, even in midday, it does, you know, uh, where, well, in midday, there's, the sun is going, is shining through less atmosphere because it's more direct. It's going straight down onto the, onto the Earth's surface, basically. And that, as you know, you know we, where we get a lot of harsh light from the sun is, is around midday. Um, it's just because it's, there's not as much opportunity for it to scatter. So this is very much an exaggeration of that where, <laughs> since there's no atmosphere here, uh, the light is really just direct and, and there's very few places for it to, to reflect. So sure, maybe you know, some of the light is being reflected off some of the, the crater edges and, and to the rest of the crater, but it's, it's very minimal compared to the, the amount of light that's just being placed from the sun. And in fact, uh, so this is from, from, from JAXA, so Japan's aeronautical, uh, I forget now exactly what it stands for, but like I said, Japan's version of, of NASA. But if you go to this website, they have a video basically of the Earth rising over, over the moon, and it's, it's, it's incredible. So I got to say the first few seconds is a little boring because you're just sort of just waiting for the, it's not like the Earth rises immediately, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but it is actually really neat to see um, another point of view, just as, as a, you know, an earth rise, something that we've never seen. We've seen sunrise plenty of times, and we've seen, well, unless you're a night owl like me, you may not have seen it ever, or you've probably seen plenty of moon rises as well, but uh, you probably have never seen uh, an earth rise. Okay, so um, exposure, this is, uh, this is one of those things where you have to be able to get it right, or you have to be able to control it in order to control the end results of your photographs. Um, and as we talked about before, there's a, a variety of things um, that can go wrong when you, when you are trying to take an exposure, when you're trying to take a photograph. And so we alluded to them earlier when we said that you can overexpose an image by one stop, two stop, many even more stops than that. So you can get typical overexposure problems such as this, where you can be trying to take a photo of a difficult situation, something like this, where you have maybe a photo of the inside of a cave, but you also have sort of direct sunlight bearing down on certain aspects of the image. And that sunlight, uh, and this is very similar to what had just happened in, in that moon photo, that sunlight that's, that's being shown on this specific area is so much brighter than the light that is inside of the cave, whether it's being emanated from a light inside of the cave or, or just being reflected uh, you know, around the atmosphere or even from the rocks that you're going to get a problem like this. So I had a choice when taking this photo, even though I may not have known it at the time, was that I could either take the photo so that this detail over here and up top is preserved at the expense of losing the detail here to shadow, or I could have taken the photo like this and completely lost some of the detail in those uh, very bright areas along the right side. And so this may seem like an impossible situation, but I said that we basically have a variety of ways that we can change some settings. So is there anything that I could do here to try to take a better photo without exposing or without overexposing or underexposing too much of this particular photo? Fill flash. Fill flash, yes. So I, I mentioned along with those three settings, one of the things that's most important is light. So you can actually change the amount of light that you have by adding more, by using a, a fill flash. So either using the flash that exists on top of your camera or using a, a separate flash unit. Or um, you could uh, use uh, a variety of other ways of just trying to get more light inside here. So for example, they make these very large uh, photographic reflectors. So if you've, if you've ever seen a video of like a professional photography shoot, they usually have these, these poor assistants that have to hold up these really big, basically white sheets of, of cloth or of paper that reflect the light, either from the flash or from the sun, uh, so that you know, it fills portions of the image that are too dark. And so that's another thing we could do, is that I could have had somebody hold up a very large reflector and put more light in over here, or even uh, these, these same reflectors can be used to remove a bit, of, a bit of light as well. So it might even be easier than trying to reflect additional light into the cave would be to have someone stand at the top 
and just hold you know, something that would shade the whole region so that now the, the whole, all of the light is much more uniform so that I have fewer of these harsh, uh, you know, these hot spots, these harsh portions of light and just a much more uniform amount of light that exists. Now there is even another method that you could do as well and this is called bracketing. So uh, just about every camera that's um, worth its salt can perform some sort of bracketing and uh, or you can even do this manually and the whole point of this is that you take three maybe five exposures at different settings. So I could take one exposure where pretty much everything is underexposed except for these rocks where I can see all of the detail very well. Then I can take another exposure that's sort of like this, you know, maybe a little bit brighter than that previous one. And so I'm starting to overexpose this region, but now I'm starting to see more of the underexposed regions from the first photo. Then finally I could take another photo still that was even brighter. So sure, I'm going to lose all of the detail over here pretty much, but then I'll be able to see all of the detail inside of, the, inside of this, this entrance to the cave. And now what you can do later on is um, you can go back using software and actually layer them on top of each other and only pick the well exposed regions from each so that you can then construct in the end from you know three original photos one photo that has you know that's overall well exposed. And um, we will talk about how to do this um, in the future and, and using more than three or five brackets you, some people will go crazy and use you know a dozen or so photos of, uh, from, from a bracket like this uh, and it's called a high dynamic range shot because now you're increasing the amount of visible light or you know what we can see here is the dynamic range of the photo so here this is too bright for the dynamic range and within the cave it's too dark but uh, by extending it in this way uh, we can actually in software increase the dynamic range and uh, this is a, a very good technique and very useful and a lot of people have used it to, to you know, very good success. Um, but I think in general what's easiest is to be able to try to modify the light at the scene if possible. So it's just easier to you know, hold up a reflector and, and block some of that light or use some fill flash and um, you know, take one photo whose exposure is correct the first time rather than having to go back and sit at your computer and work on uh, correcting this photo. But, and like I said, this doesn't mean that it's an incorrect way of, of doing it or that it's even bad. It just depends on, on what your priorities are and even you know, how much equipment you have and how much time you want to spend here versus at home. Yes? <laughs> if you really wanted to do that layer, yes. like bracketing, you'd pretty much want to use a tripod, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You'd want the pictures to be yes. identical. That's absolutely correct. You want the pictures to be identical um, for all intents and purposes except for the exposure. So um, it's, it's, you generally can't bracket when you have people in them because the people will move even very minutely and, and you'll get some sort of weirdness that exists there. Uh, you really can't handhold the camera and be able to take a bracketed exposure because you will move the camera very, very slightly and, and it's going to be a, a uh, it's going to be a, you know, a problem to try to layer that. You'll have not only a slight movement, so maybe it's even just a few pixels off, but if you tilt the camera a little bit, it's geometrically different. You get some geometrical distortion, and that is even harder to correct. And so it just becomes quite a hassle. So if you're going to bracket, then yes, you do need at least a tripod to keep it very, very still and make sure that it can um, uh, take the same photographs. And this is one reason why having the camera do the bracketing for you is, is generally a good idea because then you just have to push the button once and then the camera adjusts the settings and takes the photos three times in a row for you uh, and, and you don't have to touch the camera because if you touch the camera and try to fiddle with settings then almost certainly unless you have you know this monstrous tripod you're going to move the camera just a little bit. So okay so this is an overexposed image so similarly um, you can have an underexposed image as well and so this is very very popular when you have um, uh, maybe not popular, but you know, very common when you have a photo that is backlit or you have something like this where you have you know, a sky that is very, very bright or a background that is very, very bright and a foreground that isn't as bright. So maybe the sun just isn't shining on, on the horizon here or on, or on you know, the ground that exists right here and um, it's just very, very difficult to do it. So in this case, this is a bit harder of a situation because whereas in, in this previous photo, um, you know, this is sort of a, a tangible or it's 
it's just a manageable amount of space. You could have one reflector and you could really um, help decrease the amount of light that exists here. But when you're talking about an entire scene like this, fill flash isn't going to help you very much. It's not going to be enough to illuminate this entire scene. And so you're, you're even more restricted in what you can do. So generally here, your, your options are, are pretty much uh, overexposing the sky or using brackets or you know, you know, bracketed exposure or some measure light or something like that because it's going to be a lot more difficult to block out light from the sky or you know, add light to this entire scene uh, that exists here. But this um, actually brings us to a really, really good point in that there are good and bad times of day to take photos, and at least in terms of how easy it is. So uh, dawn and dusk, that's, you pretty much can't go wrong with photos taken at dawn and dusk because the light is not only very soft, uh, but it's very diffuse and it's also very warm that's coming from the sun. So it's not harsh light. So if you take a photo in midday, for example, you can take a good photo, of course, but the light is much, much more harsh so that you get very harsh shadows, just as we can see um, back here. It's, the light is very harsh. We can get some harsh shadows. We can get some areas that are very difficult to expose properly or, or you know, even just little tiny areas within the photo that are difficult to expose properly. But if the same photo was taken at dawn or at dusk when the light is much more diffuse, I may have less light to work with, but still it's, it's much easier to take a better picture. And during the day, um, if you have to take uh, a photo during you know, a specific time of day, then what you can really hope for is an overcast day because an overcast day means pretty much the same thing. It's going to diffuse the light quite a bit. You're not going to get the very harsh shadows from direct sunlight. You'll be able to take a much better picture um, that doesn't have any harsh shadows. So if we go back here, for example, this was taken pretty much midday or at least mid-afternoon, but there's no harsh shadows and that's just because I got lucky with the weather. So it was a nice day, but it was just overcast enough that it diffused the light and it got rid of a lot of these shadows. And if the same photo had been taken when it wasn't overcast, I guarantee that it just would not be very interesting, especially if, if the sun is not optimally placed. So maybe it's behind the players, for example, then you know, I get very backlit situation and it just becomes much more difficult. So we really are, as photographers, um, at mercy to the weather and to the time of day uh, in order to get a very, very good uh, photo, unless you have tons and tons of money and you can you know, light up this whole thing like a Christmas tree, uh, then you, know, you can get around it. So you either have to be lucky or have lots of money. And so I guess both doesn't hurt, right? So, and so each of these photos, you know, by themselves, uh, they're pretty uninteresting, but they're useful to show you as, as candidates for under and overexposure. But where things can really go wrong, and it always pains me to show people that I've actually taken a photo like this, is something like this, where you can get both underexposure and overexposure in the same embarrassing image. So in this case, for example, the sky is so overexposed, you can see nothing there, even though there were some clouds. And the bridge is so underexposed that you really can't see any of the detail here. And at the time, I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome, because there were you know, clouds and all this stuff took the photo, I looked at it, and I was, I got my car and I drove away. I was like, you know what, forget it. There's no way. That it's, it's just so hard to take a photo like this. And, and I, frankly, was not being patient enough. I didn't want to wait. I don't even know. I mean, it looks like the sun is relatively low, but it's probably a few hours before sunset still when you would actually be able to get a, uh, a pretty decent photo. But in this case, you'd have to do some pretty crazy bracketing. So you'd have to do a lot of brackets in order to try to get you know, well-exposed um, uh, bridge and well-exposed sky, um, and, and then you'd have to stitch it in software later. But the, problem, the other problem with bracketing is that if, if you do too wide of a bracket, in, in, in other words, if you change the exposure values too much, it's, it's very easy to make it obvious that you've manipulated the image. It's very easy to make it look unnatural and to make the light look sort of crazy. Like, if this photo had turned out um, well, or if I had manipulated this photo so that it did look passable in terms of the exposure, and I showed it to you, um, it would likely look uh, unnatural. And, and you, it may not, you may not know what about it looks unnatural, 
but we just have this sort of sense because we because of our experience with you know seeing the world in general of how things should look and while this is a bit exaggerated to us you know if it was absolutely perfect then something would look wrong about it so you do have to be careful about manipulating these things uh, in that way as well so but you can actually use under and, ex or under and over exposure to your benefit as well. So sometimes you actually want to intentionally underexpose something or intentionally overexpose something so that you completely get rid of some uninteresting details. So for example, if you want to take a photo of something with a completely solid background, then what you want to do is completely underexpose it or completely overexpose it so that it really overwhelms. And if you take a look at this photo on a, on a computer screen, and it's, it's more difficult to see here, you'll notice that this actually isn't a perfectly underexposed photo. It's, it's easy to make it in Photoshop, but there's a little bit of light that, that exists right here that's just outside of the, uh, the bottle. And this sort of photo is actually not that uh, difficult to take. It might take you some time, but you don't need a lot of equipment. Really, all you need is something to take a picture of, a desk lamp and some creativity. So in this case, uh, really all you have to do is, is make your room or you, know, you can make a little corner of your apartment or your home into like a, some sort of a home studio. And if you just make that room very, very dark, you can use one lamp or maybe two lamps and just shine some light on an object and try to get uh, this sort of result. Especially if you understand, like you do now, these various exposure settings you'll know that one of the things that you can do to take a photo like this is, well, you know, if, if I don't have a lot of light, but this subject isn't moving, I can use a very, very long shutter speed. So several seconds, for example. But being that it's a product shot, I don't want it to be very noisy. So I want to decrease the ISO as much as possible. And now, since also since I want to focus just on this whiskey bottle and not on, frankly, the black shirt that exists behind it, you can use a relatively low F number so that you get only the whiskey bottle in focus and then everything else behind it sort of blurs into the background, which helps re reduce the amount of texture that exists within it. So yes, like I said, all you really need is, is something to, to stand it up on and a black shirt. And if you drape that black shirt sufficiently far away, then you will be able to get um, a shot like this, which by itself you know, isn't perfect, but it's it's a very good start into you know a very professional looking photograph for sort of a product shot and if you take if you sell things on eBay or even on Craigslist you know just spending a little bit of time to do something like this will really enhance you know the you know the marketing of, of your own uh, image so uh, after this I realized that I should probably also take uh, this photo on a white background as well so I moved the black shirt and I put a white shirt there instead and um, you, if you, you have to m mess with the light a little bit because in order to overexpose something intentionally, you have to have a lot more light on that than on the subject itself. So whereas in this previous photo, uh, the lamp was positioned very carefully so that it would only illuminate sort of the left side of this whiskey bottle. And by the way, um, if you use some white sheet of paper, you know, tape it together and make sort of a large poster sized sheet of paper you can use that pretty effectively as reflector so if you have a lamp shining on this side and then a white piece of paper on this side you can reflect some of the light back so that you don't get harsh shadows again you sort of diffuse the light a little bit that way so now you can also illuminate this side a little bit with having a little bit of emphasis on a particular side for light but as long as you're careful not to illuminate the shirt itself then you won't get it in the frame and, and you may have to touch it up a little bit in software um, but that's you know probably okay. And in this case, this one is a little bit more difficult because you have to illuminate the white shirt completely. It has to be really, really, really bright when compared to um, the, the subject or the object that you're trying to take a photo of in order for it to come out well. And this one was a bit harder because I didn't have enough lamps to make the white shirt look completely white. You could still see like some folds or just some, some places where the light didn't completely illuminate it. Um, but in this case, it is easier to take a bracketed exposure. And I'm not sure that even I did that in this case, but it is one option available to you is that you could take a bracketed exposure uh, of something like this and, and reposition the light in the different, uh, in the different areas so that you could, for example, 
uh, if you put the light behind the shirt and illuminate it from behind, then you're guaranteed to get you know very backlit scene, and that's one way that you'll be able to really overpower the the white of of the shirt or the the paper that you have compared to the uh, the subject itself. Then um, you can. Um, completely overpower just a specific portion of that and then just take multiple photos after moving the lamp a certain amount and stitch it back together a little bit later. So these are just some techniques that you can use um, to really help uh, enhance the, uh, the look of your own, uh, of your own uh, photos without really needing a lot of additional equipment. Um, you can do this pretty cheaply. You can go to Home Depot and just buy some um, inexpensive halogen lights, for example, where, which are really, really bright, and yes, they get very, very hot quickly, so you have to have a you know, pretty well-ventilated room, otherwise you're going to you know, get a little warm and sweaty, but just by having some of these lights, you can take some very good photos without really even needing an SLR, because remember, a compact digital camera may not have the best high ISO performance, but when you give any modern camera just lots and lots of light to work with, and a long enough shutter speed with which to work um, at, then you can really take high quality photos, even with very small compact digital cameras. They just, they just love light. So just if you feed them lots of light by you know, basically flooding your apartment with you know, enough lights to, to, to light up Fenway on, you know, at, when there's a game, then you will, you will make a, a, a very good photo. And you can use uh, your knowledge now of these um, settings to your advantage to try to figure out what is best. And you'll notice that in this case, even though this looks very bright, this exposure was taken at 15 seconds. So there's, it was one lamp, like I said, and really in order to make it look very bright and, and very white like it is, you have to just capture lots and lots and lots of light in order to do it. Okay, so that's it for today. And next time we're going to talk about metering. So how does this camera, how do your cameras actually figure out how to do this stuff for you? Um, and we'll talk also a little bit about flash photography. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next week.